Greetings, I'm Dr. Roger Abey at Highland Presbyterian Church, and this is my video for small groups to study chapter 17 of the story. Hope you're doing well and staying healthy. Today is a very snowy, cold day. It's Friday morning, as I want to share with you a couple of things from Jeremiah and Ezekiel. So Randy Frazee does a great job on the video this week and gives you a, a good historical perspective. And then I took one passage from Jeremiah, which is uh, chapter 18 on God is the potter, that wonderful image. And so I'll preach about that, but I'm going to grab two other passages from Jeremiah and then one very familiar one from Ezekiel for you to study and consider and discuss. So Jeremiah, let me repeat what I said last week, which was uh, the introductions in Eugene Peterson's The Message are great. So I'm going to read a couple sentences from Jeremiah's. Jeremiah is a prophet of choice for many when we find ourselves having to live through difficult times. What happens when everything you believe in and live by is smashed to bits by circumstances? Sometimes the reversals of what we expect from God come to us as individuals, other times as entire communities. When it happens, does catastrophe work to reform our lives, to conform to who God actually is, and not the way we imagined or wished God to be? Does it lead to an abandonment, abandonment of God? Or worse, does it trigger a stubborn grasping to the old collapsed system of belief, holding on for dear life to an illusion. Anyone who lives in disruptive times looks for companions who have been through them earlier, wanting to know how they went through it all, how they made it, what it was like. In looking for a companion who has lived through catastrophic disruption and survived with grace, biblical people more often than not come upon Jeremiah and receive him as a true, honest, and God-revealing companion for the worst of times. Certainly appropriate for us in these challenging times that we're living in to consider these words from Jeremiah. So, uh, three different passages, and then you can pause afterwards and discuss uh, as long as you want. First one, Jeremiah 15, uh, sorry, yeah, 15, 15 to 21. So we need a volunteer to look up Jeremiah 15, 15 to 21, that could read. And while that volunteer reads, you listeners, I want you to think about these questions and, and to consider them. What is Jeremiah feeling about God? What are his circumstances? What has he done on his part? And what is he accusing God on God's part. Is Jeremiah angry, hurt, afraid, or all of the above? What is God's response? So you can pause now and focus on this wonderful, challenging prayer by Jeremiah. So, just a little wrap-up on Jeremiah 15, as Angus Mac, uh, McKillopy says, we can learn three important lessons from this passage. Through prayer, we can express everything to God, all our deepest thoughts, all our deepest longings. Secondly, God expects all Christians to trust Him, no matter what our circumstances. And thirdly, our duty as Christians is to do our best to influence others on behalf of God. So that would be uh, the very first section, just to consider what are we learning from this weeping prophet, this prophet who is lamenting so many times of the difficulties of the darkest hours of the nation of Judah, Israel, as they are about to be exiled into Babylon. 
Secondly is a familiar passage from Jeremiah 31, 31 to 34. So again, need a volunteer who would read this for everyone else, Jeremiah 31, 31 to 34. And this is really the high point of Jeremiah's prophecies. This passage is the longest sequence of Old Testament verses to be quoted in its entirety in the New Testament. So have someone else look up Hebrews 8, 8 through 12. Verse 31 contains a very important phrase, the only time it is used in the New Testament, and that phrase is new covenant. It's very important, as later is applied to the distinctly Christian part of the biblical canon, the orthodox books that are accepted as God's word. And it's referred to by millions of believers in modern times as they hear the words whenever they partake in the sacrament of communion. This cup is the new covenant sealed in my blood. So the volunteer can read Jeremiah 31 and then you can discuss these questions. What does the phrase, the days are coming, refer to? Secondly, since Hebrew translation of the English says to make a covenant, but the Hebrew translation literally means to cut a covenant, and it's referring to the institution of sacrifice um, symbolized by blood. So whose blood is understood by the hearers of the Old Covenant and whose blood is being referred to in the New Covenant? Thirdly, what does it refer to in verse 32? Covenant I made with their ancestors. What's that refer to? And here's a hint. Look up 2 Corinthians 3, 14. And what is another name of the Old Covenant? There are two other names that are given. And a hint there would be Hebrews 8, verse 7, or Hebrews 9, verse 15, and 18. Finally, number four. Elaborate on the two phrases and how do these phrases work in your life? I will write my law in their minds. I will write my law on their hearts. You can pause now. And then finally, let's go to Ezekiel. Now, what passage in Ezekiel is the most memorable scene in all the Bible. You're probably guessing right. From Ezekiel 37, 1 through 14, the Valley of the Dry Bones. The prophet reports that he was taken by the Spirit of the Lord and sat down in the middle of a great plain covered with these bones, dry bones, human bones. And the vision report moves from a description of what is seen to an interpretation of its meaning. And the dialogue is all about life and death, opening with a question that the Lord gives to Ezekiel, can these bones live? The prophet's answer is not an evasion, but an acknowledgement of the source of life. Sovereign Lord, you alone know. You know. And then the Lord makes it clear how he intends to do his, uh, the work of his will. For he commands Ezekiel to prophesy to these bones. The entire passage is held together with one consistent theme. And that theme is God's Spirit working in and through His people. In Hebrew, the word for spirit, breath, 
wind, depending on the context, is ruha, R-U-A-H. And it occurs 10 times in this passage of 14 verses. Now you look at the passage and it's divided up into three different sections. Verses 1 through 8 is the assembling of the bones into skeletons and the transformation of these skeletons into cadavers with sinews and flesh and skin. But note, they are still not alive. Verses 9 and 10 is where Ezekiel summons the life-giving breath from the four winds to give life to this array of what we could call zombies. Very similar, isn't it, to the reenactment of the primal act of creation? Look up Genesis 2, verse 7. When God formed humanity from the dust of the ground and breathed into its nostrils the breath of life. Third section is the interpretation of of this vision in verses 11 through 14. The vision is an announcement. It's a promise of life, not just of general resurrection, but of the revival of the people of God. These people who are exiled into Babylon, they will be resurrected as God's people and God will be glorified. So, this is accomplished through the Word and through the Spirit of God. The Word of God through the prophet and the life-giving Spirit as the divine gift to the people of God. Three questions. How does this passage offer you hope for living today and for eternity? Secondly, describe what it means to you and how you have experienced that Spirit of God filling you with the breath of life. And then finally, how does Ezekiel's message teach you to trust God in every situation you face today, especially in these days of uncertainty and challenge? Lord be with you. And look forward to seeing you on Sunday as we continue to dig deep into God's Word and using the story. Bye-bye.